Amen. The vision hasn't changed, friends. The vision hasn't changed. It's a great little summary clip of Wolfie and Ali, um, founding pastors of every nation. London came here 31 years ago, friends. Two backpacks and a vision to plant campus reaching churches all across Europe. It started here um, in London, and we are now, uh, we've been meeting here for 15 years. Every nation's now part of that vision. Um, Mile End in the east of London, Cardiff uh, in Wales, and uh, we've got Huntington near Cambridge. And friends, this is all part of this mission, this vision, to go make disciples, um, to glorify God and to make a difference. Amen? That's what we're living for. And friends, we are part of that. That is the wonderful thing. We are part of that man's legacy, Wolfie and Ali. Um, as we said, um, Ben mentioned, Wolfie tragically, well, not tragically, um, passed away. Um, last Friday, um, he had been fighting a two and a half year battle with cancer. Um, so of course, there is um, a lot of hurt and a lot of loss that people are facing at the moment. As well as Frederick, uh, as I said, Sheila, a part of this church, Larissa and Michelle, three vital members of this congregation. Uh, why don't you just play the, 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 the there's just um, a picture of, of, of Wolfie and Frederick. And, and friends, so this is not quite business as usual today. Um, last week, we kind of stopped our, our usual um, service, so to speak. Uh, we were preaching a series into the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we stopped some of our, our regular meetings um, just to acknowledge, to stop, to pause. As we, we, we preached last week, just taking time, as Jesus did to weep, um, to acknowledge what's going on, to not just carry on. It's not just business as usual. And friends, today it just continues in that vein to some degree that these vital parts of our family have passed on. And we want to just take time and acknowledge that. Address the hurt in the room, so to speak. And um, it is good to be together though, friends. As we said last week, family is where you mourn together. Family is where you do life together. And friends, this is important that we, we do life together. We acknowledge these moments together. And again, if you're part of a connect group, if you're not part of a connect group, if you need support, if you want to talk about some of this stuff, do come and speak to us. Do speak to your connect group leader. Our connect groups have got material to go through. Just speaking into, acknowledging how to deal with grief, with mourning, with death. But friends, that's the thing about death, that it does force us to stop. It forces us to stop and to think. It challenges some of those, or brings to the surface, should I say, emotions, feelings, perspectives on life that perhaps every other day we're not necessarily always thinking. Death can actually force us to confront particular worldviews that we might have. And it actually brings to the surface and says, well, do you actually believe what you say you believe? It's easy to say that you believe X, Y, or Z, but when the rubber hits the road, or when you're faced with situations like death of those two men in the last two weeks, do you actually believe what you say you believe? And friends, it can challenge our faith, right? I find these kind of moments can really challenge your faith. You know, Wolfie says in Follow One that he wrote, What you believe about someone will determine how you relate to them. What you believe about God, he then goes on to say, will determine how you relate to God. And friends, death can do that. What you believe about God can be challenged when death comes. Whether that's expected and sort of in some ways you know that it's coming, even though you're believing for health and for healing. Or when it's unexpected and completely out of the blue and tragic as what happened with Frederick. You're forced to sort of confront those feelings and those perspectives about your faith. You know, what do these storms and sufferings that we go through, what do they do to our faith, friends? Each of us have to answer that question. What does it do to my faith? When death is confronting you, the death of a loved one, what does it do to your faith? When prayers seem to go unanswered for years and years, decades, what does it do to our faith? And when we, how do we handle it? A broken world with radical injustice. What does that do to our faith? Is our faith shaky like this podium? 
Or is it solid? And we're actually going to watch a, a video now, a video montage of Wolfie's last sermon that he preached in West Kensington just a few months ago. He actually preached the sermon in February here in Slough when he was last here. And then over the months he kind of just refined it a, bit, a little bit. And so he preached it to the congregation in West Kent. And we're going to watch that in a moment. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit to bring out a few points. But let's just take a moment right now and just pray. Father, we just invite you here, Holy Spirit. If we're joining online, or if we're in this room, or if we happen to watch this sermon in a few weeks' time, Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. God, you want our faith to be solid and strong. God, you always want to draw us closer to you, that we would know you better, love you more deeply. Holy Spirit, you guide us, you comfort us in mourning and weeping and grief, and you also teach us. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you now to each heart and to each mind right now. Come and teach us. Come and reveal yourself to us. In this moment, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, AJ. Won't you roll that video, please? My story, our story is that two and a half years ago, um, I was diagnosed with having cancer. Skin cancer started, skin cancer that spread to, that had spread to, metastasized or spread throughout my body to my back, my spine, um, my liver, my lungs, my, up my neck, my brain, lymph nodes, all over the place. Um, the prognosis was terrible. And uh, many of you who know me would know the journey we've been on since then. There was a time that I could not even step up a little step like this onto the stage to, to speak up here. And sitting down and uh, just skin and bone and uh, through the treatment we've had from the NHS has been brilliant. But it's been a very crazy journey with a number of treatment options and the journey as we go, um, ups and downs along the way. Um, some of you would have seen recent, this recently maybe a, I, I rang the bell in the radio Therapy session, some of you thought that that was my bell for, for it's all over, but that was the end of a series of treatment that I had treating last weekend a tumor to my, that was pressing into my spine and uh, threatening to paralyze me in my legs. So we had that. And then this Tuesday, Ali and I met with my oncologist and um, together with them concluded that what the NHS has to offer in uh, in treatment has come to an end. There is no treatment that they can continue to offer us to be curative of this. And that's how we walked out of the oncologist's office on Tuesday. Um, and obviously, from a medical diagnosis or prognosis point of view, there's a time frame attached to that as well. Um, that's where we were. That's where we were this week. That's where what we faced on Tuesday afternoon. Um, as you can imagine, that is something that would test your faith, right? We've had our faith tested. Verse 18, for I consider that the suffering in this present age and time are not worthy to be compared to, this, to the glory which will be revealed to us. The stuff you're going through now is nothing in compared to the amazing that God has for you in eternity. This is the promise of the gospel. And this is the only worldview that makes sense of the suffering we prayed for this morning. Because there is more to life than this, friends, and Paul reminds us of here. And then just one other statement he makes is that greater is, no, that's not the one. It says, if God is for you, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? Paul reminds us, and he reminds you and he invites you if you have not this, get God inside of you. Because the greater one is ready to move inside by your invitation. He stands at the door and knocks, and if you will open that door, he's going to come in and your life will be changed, transformed. But this is written to believers. Those who have said yes. Some of you might stand on the outside of the story today and you might 
look and say, well, I don't get this, but I'm saying to you, God is inviting you to step in, and I hope you'll say yes and come in and be one of those to whom this is written, and you will experience the benefits and the blessings of the gospel and as a follower of Jesus Christ. I made this decision, and, and it has... I, I wouldn't swap my life for anything else or anybody else's life I've ever known. But, so it's important to know who you trust in because what you, what you know about him, believe about him, will determine what you believe him for. And here's the minimum that you need to know about him in, this, in the faith sense. You need to know that he's powerful. Right? God is powerful. God is almighty. That means he is able. He is able. He's able to do whatever. He, he is almighty. He works miracles. He can do anything. But you also need to know that he is wise. And he sees the world and the way we work very... We, we see a little part, he sees the whole. And some of things are for a king to conceal, right? Some matters are for a king to conceal. We don't see the whole puzzle. So we acknowledge that God, you are wise and all-knowing. And therefore your, your view of things and the way things work together and the timing of things are very different to my view. I see a little bit, and I acknowledge that God is wise, and I am not fully wise. And then He is good. God is good. When the dust is settled on everything, we will declare God is good. He loves us. His love is unchanging. His motivation for the gospel was love. Because God loved us, for God so loved the world, He gave. The gospel exists because God is love, God is good. And because of His goodness, His love, He, he gives, delivers by grace His gospel, right? Jesus is the conqueror. Christ is the conqueror and it points back to the cross. The, on the cross, Jesus won the battle against all spiritual forces, darkness and sin and hell and death were conquered on the cross through Jesus' death, burial and resurrection. He is the great conqueror. Jesus conquered in his battle on the cross. And when you get that and draw in your life, the benefits, the blessing, the power of that victory can flow into your life, into any circumstance that you face. It comes from the cross to you and then through you to anything that you face. The victory of the cross, the resurrection power of the cross showing up in any circumstance that you face. And friends, circumstances are not the conqueror. They don't have to be. They could if you let them. And cancer is not the conqueror. But let's be honest. Many, many people have died of cancer in exactly the same things that I've gone through. They've had faith. They've believed. And they have died. You know, friends, family, every one of us would know somebody who's passed away. And all sorts of other things that you've prayed for in your circumstances that haven't worked out. Is that, is that honest? Is that real? What do we do with that? Because if you don't have a, 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 an answer, a, a reason for that hope, you are never going to build a persuaded faith. And the way I have responded to this is to look at it this way. There are mysteries and when I look at healing there is a measure of mystery. I've just read a whole book on miracles. There are so much, there's so much evidence that, that miracles happen when the natural processes are suspended and God shows up like that, that's just crazy. You may know some stories but that, that is fact. And then there's and then, then others don't get healed. So I believe in miracles and I'm believing for a miracle, but there is a mystery. If I build my faith on mysteries, I am in trouble. Because it might happen, it might not happen. What if it doesn't happen? What if it does? Is that where I'm living? So here's how, here's how I've approached it. There's mysteries in which I inject as much faith as the Spirit moves me to have. And then on the other side, there are certainties. There are persuasions. And it's in this category that I build my persuaded faith. Even though I say that, with great faith, my faith is not in my healing. 
or whether I will or not be. That there's a mystery there. I am great faith there, but there is a mystery. But Paul then moves over and he lists a few things that will not separate. If you get revelation of these things, they'll help you with the certainty, with the foundations on which you can build a persuaded faith. The first word that I want you to know there is that neither death, death will not separate you. When I go and receive this diagnosis, the first thing that I did for, for quite a couple of weeks was to ask myself the question, do I really believe what I've been preaching, reading in the Bible, about eternal life. When I die, what happens? What I really believe happens. If you were to die today, what is your tomorrow? Are you, are you, is it a mystery? Like, I have no idea, I hope it's okay. Or is it certainty? And you've got to come to a place where you get a firm foundation under what happens when you die. Because the message of the gospel is not, the, we don't decide to help you just to get a better life through this book. The idea is the wages of sin is death, it separates you from God, but the good news is that through Jesus, you have the free gift of eternal life. The message is a message of eternal life. To live forever. The Bible is full of this revelation that this life is not all there is. There is this short, twinkling in the eye life, and you could end this life just by going like this. I could stay here for three minutes and it would be over for me. This is the breath. And then there's eternal life. We have the gift of eternal life. Paul says to, 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 to live is Christ. But to die is gain. It's better. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. How many of you like the presence of the Lord? And count the nights here. You want the presence? Just die. <laughs> the real presence of God. Sadly, you will, some, some will face the judgment seat of God and that presence will be pretty short because you've chosen to flee from His presence, to reject His presence here, yeah, and you'll get what you chose there. That's, that's my persuasion. And based on that persuasion, I make the right choices here yeah, to make sure I'm there. But death comes to you. Every one of us are going to die. You are going to die. You might die prematurely. Some will die prematurely, unexpectedly, crazy reasons. But every one of us are going to die whether that's through natural or whatever. The question is just what happens to you when you die? What are you persuaded about? Do you have the gift of eternal life? You are going to die. Even Lazarus died again. The second, the second, and this is this for me quick. The second is the love of God. That word love, are you convinced that God loves you and on what basis are you convinced that God loves you? A weak faith looks to circumstances, says God, if my job's going well, my relationships are going well, if I'm happy, if, 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 if I'm healthy, then it'll be okay. I mean, that, that proves love. But friend, do not, that's weak faith. A persuaded faith looks to the cross because the book of Romans chapter 5 says, on the cross, God demonstrated His love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Build your faith on the certainty that God's love was demonstrated to you on the cross, not through circumstances. Your faith will be weak if you wake up tomorrow and you've got some challenges and you determine, well, God, you love me or you don't love me because of this or that. You anchor it in the love of God on the cross and from there it flows into every situation. And you know that just like the book of this Romans chapter 8, I didn't quote it, but all things, we know that all things work together for good for those who love Him. He proved it there, and I can experience it here in any circumstance, no matter what. Friend, know that God loves you, and please, if and when I die, do not say God is not good, or God doesn't love me, or love is love. He is love, not because of what happens to me or to you, but what happened on the cross. Amen. The next one is, is the word Lord. He is Lord. G 
Jesus is more than Jesus. The revelation over here is that is that on the cross, the apostles, when they looked at that, they said, This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. He is not just Jesus. He's not just in the name of Jesus. Get a revelation because the greater your revelation, understanding of who Jesus is, the stronger and more persuaded your faith will be. If your view of Jesus is little, you're going to have a little weak faith. But I want to encourage you, go to God, go to the Bible, say, God, give me a revelation of who you are. He is the Christ on the cross, all that he did to conquer. We've spoken about that. That is who he is. And he is a Lord of all. He is in charge over all. Whatever happened, he is a sovereign and in charge ultimately. Amen. And we can trust and faith that in all things, at all times, he is good, he is able, he is wise. Amen. Because he is Lord. But build your faith over here on the certainties. And then the question will be, well, if you believe this, there's another word that life. If you believe this, friend, how will you live? The Apostle Paul at the end of his, when he's wrestling with, you know, what's better to go with Jesus or to be here, he, he pauses and he says, one thing, he says, whatever state I'm in, whether here or there, I choose to live to please him. That's a good start, right? Make a choice today that you will live to please God, to honor him, to glorify him, as our mission statement says. I am going to live to the glory of God, whatever that looks like. And then Paul says, as he looks at his circumstances, he looks at them and he says, all these things have happened to me and he's got his list and then he's in jail. And this is what he says. He says, all these things have turned out for the advancement of the gospel. Ultimately, he looks and says, God, I'm your servant, I'm your slave. In this life, I will lay my life down, pour it out, because everything is for your glory. Amen. For the gospel and it will show up for my good. It says, we are more than conquerors. And that word we doesn't mean everybody. This, this chapter 8 is not written to everybody. It was written to those who have believed. So you might be sitting here today and, and, and you are not part of that we. You have not yet believed. You have not said, I believe in the gospel and I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, that God raised him from the dead and therefore I am saved, born again, whatever language. You want to use. You don't have that relationship with God. You, the we is the family of God. It's those who together, individually and together, have believed. And I want to encourage you, friend, if you're sitting there, I want to reiterate the invitation. Be part of the we today. Become part of the we today. The, 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 the Lord is at your door knocking. And he's saying, will you let me in? Will you let me in? And then he, the language he uses is, is you, you get into a relationship with him. You sup with him. You eat with him. You have fellowship with him. And with his bride, the family of God that will come back and be together in eternity with him. There is a great invitation to you and online to say yes to that gospel today. And if you're sitting on the outside, please speak to somebody. Pray with somebody today. Your friend who brought you and say, I, I want to figure that out. I want to be part of the we because I don't want to be separated from God through sin and I definitely don't want circumstances to overcome me. I can and want to know this God through the gospel. So I just want to clarify that, that you're not sitting there and saying, well, this is some pep talk I can give myself and it's going to work out. This comes through relationship with the greater one, with the conqueror, amen, through whom you are conqueror because he loved you and you responded to that love. My greatest prayer would be, that you and I will be together in eternity. It's going to be amazing. I bless you with a confident, persuaded faith. In Jesus' name.
Just take stock, do a brief audit. Is my faith a fully persuaded faith? What is my faith built on? Is it built on the, the mysteries, the mystery of healing? Is your faith built on the mystery of answered prayer? And if my prayers are answered, then my faith will be strong. Is our faith built on all our dreams coming true, breakthrough, healing, deliverance, whatever it might be, your, your promise is coming, coming to fruition. Is our faith built on that? Is that what we're believing for, that it's got to go well as I expected, that life has to turn out the way I think it should, the way I believe God has said it will? Is that what we're building our faith upon? Friends, only you can answer these questions. Or is it built on the certainties? Do we even know God enough to have any certainties? It's a challenge to spend more time with this wonderful God who will reveal himself to you, to me. He will reveal those certainties that we can build upon. His goodness, his love, that love demonstrated through the cross not demonstrated through circumstances and how things turn out. Built on the certainties of his wisdom. He's got the big picture, friends. He sees all of it. The certainty is powerful and able. Almighty. All powerful. Do we have that persuasion, that conviction around who God is? His Lordship. Everything in our lives coming under that Lordship. Not just certain bits. Everything, every relationship. Finances, jobs, education. All of it comes under the Lordship of Jesus. These are those certainties, friends. The power of the Gospel, that alone, is the only worldview that makes sense of what we find ourselves living in. The chaos, the tragedy, the brokenness. Premature death. Tragedies like what happened in Slough 10 days ago with Frederick. Friends, it's only those certainties, our convictions of who God is, that helps us to make sense of these things. I ask myself, I encourage you to ask yourself, what am I building on? Am I building on certainties? We're not building on mysteries. Friends, um, you can open your eyes, but I'm going to be concluding now. But I had the wonderful privilege of knowing Wolfie pretty well. These last three years in particular, I got to know him very well. And if it wasn't for that man, I would not be standing here today, that's for sure. He had incredible influence over so many people. His legacy, as we saw in that brief video. But friends, I think Wolfie would want us to celebrate. Celebrate his life. Put a smile on your face. Celebrate this man. Celebrate a life lived in service of one greater than himself. Man who gave everything to see the gospel advanced, disciples made, to see God glorified, to acknowledge God's hand in all of that, for that God will be glorified as we celebrate Him. Yes, we celebrate Him and His life, but God gets the glory, amen? He is the one who is exalted and praised and thanked for a man like Wolfie and his legacy. Celebrate Come next week, Saturday. We're all invited, friends. It will be online on the Every Nation London YouTube page. But if you can't be there, come to St. Paul's to celebrate his life. Friends, if you want us to process, process this. As we shared last week in the sermon, don't just rush past it. Process his death. Do it well. Do it in community. And he would want us, our, our faith to be strengthened, friends. Without a doubt, that man is always turning every opportunity into a learning and growing opportunity. And friends, we can grow in this.
this message that we heard today, it can be a turning point for some of us today. Some of us perhaps who have been living with this faith built on certainties and mis- uh, built on mysteries and hopes. And maybe today we can leave this place with a conviction to build our lives, to build our faith upon the certainties of who God is. Not because Wolfie said so, but because we get alone with God and we get our own personal conviction of this God that we live with, that we celebrate, that we acknowledge. And friends, after that, I think you want us to get on with it, to get on with the mission. Get on with the mission, friends. There are more nations to be reached. There are more campuses to be touched. There are more churches to be planted. There is our God to be glorified. There are disciples to be made. And we can make a difference, friends. So would you stand with me, please, as we respond now. I'm going to invite Eddie, and Hannah, AJ, Tony back up. We sing a final song. I think that second song about hell lost another one. I think that would be a cool song to end with. But friends, I think the response today is twofold. If you're uncertain about your tomorrow, if you would die today, if you're uncertain where you would go, today's a day you can respond. You can put your faith in Jesus. Perhaps even now, every eye closed, then you bow your heads, however you feel comfortable. But friends, if you want to make that decision for Jesus today, if you want to say, I'm not sure where my eternity lies, then I'll ask you to do something brave and to raise your hand. I can just lead you in a prayer. I'm going to make you come to the forward. Can I come forward? But if you say, I want to put my faith in Jesus for the very first time, or to recommit your life again and say, Jesus, I come back to you. Why don't you raise your hand? Just raise your hand high so that I can see it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you just repeat after me, friends? Father, I thank you for your love. Thank you that your love was demonstrated on the cross 2,000 years ago. Jesus, I acknowledge you're the only way to the Father. You're the only one to forgive sin. You're the only one to restore me to life. I put my faith in you. I acknowledge my sinfulness. And I receive your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, friends. Then second response I would say is to do what we've done. Take stock. Examine your faith. Build upon certainties, not mysteries. If you need help with that, let's talk about it. But we can make a decision today to build our lives upon those certainties and not the mysteries. Amen. Anyone should give us in that song and then Ben's going to close us out. Bless you, friends.